Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is Matthew Continetti, Senior Fellow and Patrick and Charlene Neal Chair in American Prosperity at the American Enterprise Institute. He was also the founding editor and editor-in-chief of the Washington Free Beacon. Previously, he was opinion editor at the Weekly Standard. His new book is The Right, The Hundred-Year War for American Conservatism. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Matthew. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Your book walks through the hundred-year history of American conservatism, but when I saw the title, when I opened it up, I it begins with Warren G. Harding, essentially. But I thought it would begin with Roosevelt, with, with Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, why didn't you start with him? The main reason I started with Harding and not Theodore Roosevelt was um, Harding and Harding's vice president and then successor Calvin Coolidge really define themselves against progressivism. And uh, Roosevelt, while he certainly belonged in some ways on the right, especially during his earlier years, um, by the time he runs for president uh, in 1912 in the famous election, he's definitely associating with the philosophy of progressivism. And so for me, uh, the one thread uh, in, in my story is that the American right, and specifically the American conservative movement, has always been critical of the progressive philosophy, the idea of expertise, um, bureaucratic management, the federal government as the agency of uh, social change and economic uplift. And for that reason, um, it was uh, just easier for me as a writer to begin with Harding and Coolidge, where they're kind of coming out of the progressive era after Woodrow Wilson and kind of establishing uh, what uh, Harding called normalcy. Coolidge and Harding both called Americanism, uh, rather than kind of having to explain Teddy and all of his idiosyncrasies. Oh, the reason I ask is, is I mean, you could have course started anywhere, but there, there does seem to be yes. a current of Teddy Roosevelt's thought that doesn't ever completely leave the right or American conservatism. And now you see it again with like, say, Josh Hawley, of, of whom Ted, Teddy Roosevelt is his idol, that there is a desire to use government for positive aims, you know, to crack down on businesses. So, so that, that, thing never goes away. You see some of it in Eisenhower, you see some of it in Nixon. So there are parts of Teddy Roosevelt's philosophy, maybe not by 1912 with the, the famous you know, tripartite election, but parts of his philosophy that still are in conservatism, arguably. Yeah. If you look at um, Roosevelt's famous speech, The New Nationalism, um, that is definitely an important text for Senator Hawley. But I think it's important to recognize that Senator Hawley now defines himself against much of what the conservative movement stood for uh, for for many decades, um, and and so what I wanted to do was really tell the story of the conservative movement, which most people associate with the Cold War and the post World War II era. What I found, though, is that in order to tell the story in the full and round, I had to begin earlier. I kind of had to show where those conservatives were coming from, what they were responding to. And then uh, I had to show why FDR and the New Deal represented to them such a huge break in American history. And for that reason, I began in the 1920s. So you're right. The, um, Hawley definitely sees a lot of himself in Teddy Roosevelt, uh, draws inspiration from Teddy. Um, but uh, he is more of um, a development that is set against the the greater current that I talk about. And could be when I write the sequel, uh, it could be that Holly is much more important to the story. And so I, I do need to kind of talk about Teddy's uh, looming shadow. Yeah, but, we'll see. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have to see what happens in the next 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Do you make a distinction between conservatism and the right? I do. So um, this is why the book is called The Right, which is that um, I think that we hear American conservatism we think Barry Goldwater, we think Ronald Reagan, William F. Buckley Jr., 
George F. Will. But that's actually a fairly limited circle of thinkers and ideas and institutions. And there's a much broader category that I call the right, which is composed of intellectuals, activists, groups who, despite not sharing all of the ideas of American conservatism, are nonetheless opposed to the left. So that's kind of the distinction I make between this broad category of the right and then this smaller group of the American conservative movement. And I felt that in order to understand the American conservative movement better, it needed to be set against this larger backdrop because that way we can understand that there are still people and figures on who are anti-liberal, they're anti-left, but they're not quite be- members of the conservative movement. And that, of course, I think has come a little bit more to the fore uh, in the post-Trump era that just opposing the left is what needs to be, can be defining characteristic of being on the right. But why is that the inverse not true? Well, I mean, the, I don't think if there was a book, a hypothetical book called The Left, with that, with the story of that, because there's a, it's like, that's a huge group of people from Marxists to social Democrats to, you know, progressives. Uh, do they, I mean, we're, define themselves as against the right, or are they doing something different? That's a great question. I think it actually kind of has to go to kind of the roots of ideological politics. Um, in order for there to be a right, there needs to be a left. The left doesn't need the right in the same way. Right. So if you think about it, um, there was no Orthodox Judaism before there was Reform Judaism. There was just Judaism. Uh, there was no Catholic Church before the Protestant Reformation. It was just the Church. It was just Christianity. There was no conservatism before the French Revolution because that was just the way things were. So you kind of need the left to establish the right because the, uh, and this is a problem for the right because the right often feels imprisoned by the left's categories and always feels that it's reacting to the left's agenda. But this is a long-standing dilemma on the right. Uh, for liberals and for the left, um, in fact, th- they so don't require the right that they're often puzzled that the right exists. <laughs> what don't you, why aren't you on our side? And they res- they respond to the existence of the right in a couple of ways. They pathologize it. They accuse it of false consciousness. They say it's just a group. It, it's motive. It, it, they attack its motives. The right doesn't have that luxury because the right is always responding to the left. The left does one thing, and the right has to say, "Oh no, this is why you don't want to do it that way." It's very rarely that the right is able to formulate a positive agenda of its own. In fact, that's one of the criticisms Friedrich Hayek makes of European conservatism, of traditionalist conservatism, in his famous essay, Why I'm Not a Conservative. He says that it's just purely reactive. To be like Hayek, what Hayek calls himself in that essay a liberal, he also calls himself a Whig. He associates with James Madison, interestingly enough. He says, you know, we have, we, the, the Whigs or the Madisonians or the liberals, have principles, and that those principles allow us to have a forward agenda. So um, it, you're right to point out that relationship. It's a very uh, interesting one that I think often causes people on the right a lot of frustration because, you, you know, you hear it all the time, I'm sure. It's like, well, we're always on defense. That's kind of baked into the cake. If you're a conservative, you're always trying to defend something. Well, of course, libertarians have a, a uneasy relationship with the with the right. I, I think, and especially myself. But uh, then, where we talked about, so what defines the left? If it's not defined by being antagonistic to the right, is it defined by just pushing for 
certain types of social upheaval and social change essentially is a broad category? Um, well, uh, look, I would say that uh, if the roots of classical liberalism are in basically emancipation of the individual from um, basically corporate identities and, and, um, and also the establishment of a sphere of uh, freedom uh, from interference. You know, the traditionalist right, as we know, is hostile to that, right? Then there are more radical forms of leftism, which kind of stem from the idea that, well, you know, freedom is not enough, right? You need to, to truly be free, we need to be equal. And not just equal in opportunities or in rights, we need to be equal in condition. And that then requires some agency to make us equal. The agency of the state, usually, right? Um, and so there, there's the, if you look at the classical liberalism, uh, that's more about freedom. But when I think of the left, I think more about the egalitarianism, the drive toward equality of condition. Um, the the drive to a race difference um, because difference prevents the community the the community of citizens. Well, that that makes it's so that's not endorsing some sort of idea, which I think correctly not endorsing idea that the right is for limited government in a general sense uh, because. It's for limited government. Maybe if the left is defined, you kind of define it by what would be a domestic policy aim, or at least internal you know, social policy aim. But the right is not for limited government when it comes to, say, military, and also when they decide to do things like, well, schools are a good example. Like uh, running public schools are everything about about using the power of government to determine what the public schools are going to teach, which has been recent controversies. Um, which is not necessarily an indictment. I mean, as someone who's across the board for limited government, um, but you didn't mention many sort of foreign policy or individual rights aspects of your little kind of distinction there, which I found to be interesting. Well, I think maybe that's because the foreign policy flows from these deeper ideas about, about the world. Um, conserve the traditionalist right wants to uphold the social order. It doesn't really matter what social order that is. If you read uh, the, the Israeli uh, philosopher Yoram Hazoni's new book, he's like, well, America should have a Christian polity because the majority of Americans are Christian. And if the majority of Pakistanis are Muslim, then it should be an Islamic polity, right? This is one of the early criticisms of Russell Kirk, the great traditionalist conservative of the 20th century, where figures from Hayek to um, Walter Burns, a Straussian philosopher, to even Samuel Huntington, um, the political scientist at Harvard, said, you know, this type of traditionalism is completely contextual. There's no principle to it. It's just, well, whatever social order we have, we have to defend. And that means that it tends to um, want to have a sense of hierarchy, a preservation of um, kind of long-standing institutions such as the family, the church, the local, the locality. And in foreign policy terms, it probably leads to a kind of a very kind of re restrained foreign policy of the national interest. You don't, you're not, you're not trying to go out, right? It, as John Quincy Adams says, we're not searching for monsters to destroy. We're, we want to preserve what we have. Um, that changes, you know, uh, from, uh, you know, a more, foreign policy influenced by classical liberalism, say, 
would probably be a little bit more assertive in the world, right? And and that would run the, uh, you know, and, and I know that, that libertarians, of course, tend to have a, a a more restrained foreign policy as well. But I do think that um, when you value a principle, you like to see it defend. You like to see it defended, or you you, you know, you kind of have a sympathy to it abroad. And that can run from the gamut from just like pursuit of the national interest to kind of a more Wilsonian, well, we need to change the world to reflect our principles, right? And then for the, the radical left too, I think there the, the aims are very globalist in the sense that, you know, the, the revolution's not done until we're all part of it, right? So yeah, I think, I think, a, I think the foreign policies reflect these deeper philosophical dispositions and attitudes toward the nature of the individual and his or her relation to the social world. One of the interesting themes that I I kind of picked up in the book, and I do think it's, I like how you start with Harding. I think it's a good decision. But for my whole life, I was born in 1980. It seemed to me that American conservatism, since, since the Reagan era, and maybe a little bit before, is sort of a persecution movement. That basically you have Reagan, you have William F. Buckley Jr., you have Rush Limbaugh starting in the 80s, you have and even you know talk radio people in the early 60s. They're always saying, here is what they are not telling you. And by they, they mean the media, Hollywood, like ma the mainstream media, Hollywood, public schools, and universities. And so they're going to tell you the secret truths that no one is telling you. And then you develop this persecution complex, which, you know, Fox News is like, we're going to finally have our own network. And the conservatives still have it. And even though Fox News is the most popular cable news network, they still think that they are the outsiders and everyone is against them and they have secret truths. And, it, and the interesting thing is it seemed like that has always been a little bit of a theme in American conservatism on the right. You know, when, the, when FDR and the New Dealers take over, there's this, you know, John, John T. Flynn and people saying, let me tell you the actual truth. So this sort of persecution movement against what is perceived as the dominant culture. Right. And that's why I think, I, I felt I wanted to talk about the 1920s, where that didn't necessarily exist. It was a different dynamic, where you know you had Harding and Coolidge and the Republican Party at its height, and um, which is kind of this is what America is: it's laissez-faire economics with a high protective tariff, but also limited government, and uh, where we love the Constitution, and, and then you have the New Deal, and uh, the New Deal changes everything. It changes the nature of that relationship between the citizen and the state. It changes the nature of the state. It centralizes power in Washington, D.C., grows all these bureaucracies, concentrates authority within the executive. And the right is now on the outs. And this sense of cultural estrangement that you're talking about, that, that's present from the 1930s. What's going on here? This is not us. This is not our country. We're left out of government because we're not running the show. And by the way, the Republican Party is basically a you know smoking ruin in the 1930s. It takes forever to recover. Um, we don't have any access to the universities. The universities have been taken over by progressives. They've been taken over by um, natural philosophers or you know materialist philosophers. The media is a little bit different. There's there's conservative media, even in the Hearst papers, the McCormick papers hated Roosevelt, right? But but you know Roosevelt's the dominant force, and um, so there's a sense of uh, exile that's present. We're on the outs, right? And so you get to the point where in 1950, the famous uh, lament. It's actually a lament of the literary critic Lionel Trilling, where he says, you know, in the United States today, are, there are no conservative ideas in general circulation, right? So conservatives feel like they're they're just not included. And uh, you're absolutely right to suggest that that continues today. Even, even and I, I often want to tell my friends, <laughs> the conservatives or on the right, you know, it's like, guys, it's not as bad as you think. Compare the situation to 1964. 
you know, Barry Goldwater runs for president. He becomes a Republican nominee, the first conservative nominee of the Republican Party since 1936. There's no Fox News. There is no talk radio. You know, you have the Clarence Mannion has a show, but I mean, it's not not what it is today. There's no real conservative publishing. Nas- National Review is nine years old. When you look at the situation today, you have a conservative media, you have conservative publishing, you have talk radio, um, you have conservative institutions, you have the Republican Party. I mean, it's <laughs> to, it still has conservative elements, even though it's gone in a much more MAGA or now even ultra MAGA direction, right? Um, but yet that sense of kind of alienation is present. And they look at the school, they look at the schools, it's the same institutions you mentioned, the schools, the media, the entertainment industry, and they're saying, where are we? You know, we're not seen, we're losing. I think that's one reason that it can create, persecution complexes in general can create bad thinking. I think you have to be aware if you have such a persecution complex. But it also gets to the point for some people, and, and especially in the magosphere and, and some of the crazy ideas we're dealing with today, that it, it kind of seeps over to the point where you say, well, they always lied to me. They never told me the truth. And so and so I'm now presuming that they're lying. And 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 the they or the, the group, the groups that we're talking about, some sort of amorphous they, they're lying to you, and then leading to I think very bad thinking. But I think that even happened. Like Father Coughlin, you you talk about he 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 led people to some very bad thinking and different figures at different time uh by by participating in this sort of persecution complex. I think I I think conspiracy theory, which is is what you're referring to there, is a is a constant danger for the right. Now, people have asked me, you know, as I talk about the book, they say, "Well, is it just the right that has conspiracy theories?" And now I say, "No." You know, I mean, I think that you know the JFK assassination theory is kind of associated with the left. Um, the idea that you know the CIA was pumping drugs into the inner cities in order to create the crime wave of the '80s. That's a conspiracy theory of the left. Um, anti-Semitism, of course, is a giant conspiracy theory that has expressions of left and right. So it's not that conspiracy theory is limited to the right, but it is, I think, a constant temptation of the right, precisely because conservatives have felt themselves outside since the New Deal. They're outside. We don't, you know, it's like the talk about the deep state, right? Well, we don't control the bureaucracies. We're not in charge. Someone else is in charge, you know? Um, The schools, what's happened? Right now, I think sometimes when they make these points, they're on to something. I mean, <laughs> clearly their ideas have not penetrated the public school system. <laughs> um, but but the danger, as you suggest, is going from there to just kind of cockamamie ideas, or um, another danger, which is to say, well, things are so bad, this things are so apocalyptic, we need to take emergency measures or instill authority into some type of demagogic leader. Yeah. And 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 that kind of gets into another theme of the book, which is the populism versus I'll just call it principalism of a sort, uh, meaning like ideas, this idea this the party of ideas kind of kind of situation. But then this populism creeps in and you point out that it's 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 not like Donald Trump discovered conservative populism in 2015, <laughs> right? right? And because if yeah. if you're just sort of a Reagan era person and you think that the conservatives actually believe in something, free markets, free trade, things like this, you realize that that's not always the case. Sometimes the rabble rousing comes in against the left, as you say, against the elites, against the left, and just riles up the masses to be just against something. Yeah. I I mean, one of the reasons that I really wrote this book was to make this point that not only is populism not new to America, I mean, it's been there since the beginning, but right-wing populism is not new either. And um, I, I spent a lot of effort trying to trace this movement over time. And I think you can see it beginning with the McCarthy era. Um, I think you can see it through the era of George Wallace in the 60s and 70s and the attraction of many on the right to Wallace. 
Um, you see it with Pat Buchanan after the Cold War in the 1990s. And then, of course, its most successful variant, so to speak, was Donald Trump. Because unlike those other populist leaders, Trump not only won the Republican nomination for president, he ended up winning the presidency. And once you become president, you imprint yourself not only on the world, but also on your political party and the movements associated with it. And I often think that, you know, even if Trump had won the nomination in 2016, had he lost the general election, the Republican Party and the conservative movement might be in a very different place than it is today. Is Reagan a, a, a blip in your story in, in, in the sense, well, on one level he is because he is a kind of generation-defining president in a way that other presidents have. I mean, it's 40 years after he was elected and we're still talking about him consistently, which I think that, you know, I'm thinking about, say, 1922. And did they spend a lot of time talking about Garfield and Chester Allen Arthur in 1922? <laughs> no. And I don't think they did. And it, and Reagan comes in and he says, you know, from Cato's standpoint, my standpoint, one of his sort of famous quotes is libertarianism is the heart of conservatism and that this is, he's got ideas and he's governing not based on populism and he's going to be a transformative president that we still talk about. Uh, is it kind of that we have the Reagan era and then tr then now we're probably in the Trump era that just the signals the end of the Reagan era? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, just your point about consequential presidents, there's really only other one other president of the 20th century who we refer to as much as Reagan, and that's FDR. And I think they kind of, they're the two poles of the 20th century in a lot of ways. Um, Reagan is a unique figure. And um, when you set him against this backdrop of 100 years, it, his novelty kind of um, becomes more visible. Uh, it's not just the principle and also the constancy of the principle. You know, I have quotes from him in the 1940s that are very much like the quotes that he gave when he left office in 1989. Um, it's also the way that he was able to act as a ecumenical figure. Every, basically everyone on the right wanted to be associated with Reagan or felt that he was kind of on their side, right? And yet, he had his own distinct approach. Um, he, uh, he could appeal to populace. He could appeal to the religious right. He could appeal to neoconservatives. And you know, kind of a love-hate relationship, he could appeal to libertarians too, right? You know, But um, he appealed to all these groups. He also had um, a, a, a way about him which was – unique among conservative leaders, which is to say, he was happy. He smiled. He had a sense of humor. He was self-contained. Uh, one of his aides, John Sears, who uh, managed his campaigns in the 70s and 80s, he said that Reagan had negative capability, which is a literary term, but what Sears meant is that uh, Reagan just kind of like was immune to criticism. Like he was aware of it, and anyone who reads his diaries knows he paid attention. But it just it, he he was unflappable. So very uh, like Liam Neeson had taken particular set of skills Reagan had, and they are, they're definitely unique when when you compare them with some of the other major figures on the right in my history. We mentioned it a couple times, and, I, and you talk about in the book, that the right, you, this is about the American right, not, not the right in other countries. But do you see, I mean, are there at least some things in common with parts of the American right uh, be, because of, say, well, and in, in international uh, Europe, for example, or South America, because with Trump, I've always said that Trump seemed to kind of turn the American right into what the right is in most other countries, which is populist, nationalist, and traditionalist, whatever that means within the country. And many of my European friends were the ones who were the least surprised that Trump won 
because they saw it. They saw him come up and they said, yeah, we've, we've seen these people all before. Uh, you thought that the conservative or the right was standing out for free markets and limited government, but really it's just standing for traditionalism, nativism, and populism. Uh, so is that, are there lessons we can learn from other right wings in other countries? Mm -hmm. Um, my Israeli friends told me the same thing in, uh, the, during the Trump presidencies, they, they were always like, Matt, we don't understand why Americans are so all riled up about him. He's like every, you know, you should see some of our Israeli right-wing politicians. <laughs> um, it's a very good way of putting it. Uh, I, I do think that for the post-war, post-World War II American conservative movement, um, that movement drew on certainly some European thinkers, typ typically emigres, so drew from the Austrian school, drew from Leo Strauss and his ideas, um, and also had connections to um, British conservatism, longstanding con con uh, connections. And of course, the interplay between Thatcher and Reagan was very important, and Thatcher even coming to power prior to Reagan kind of a sign of where things were headed. You're right to say that as the Republican Party has moved from Reaganism toward Trumpism, the conservative movement, it seems, has also begun looking more and more outside the so-called Anglosphere for inspiration. Now, partly uh, there were ties between the Trump movement and the Brexit movement, you know, in England, right? But now, of course, the right is fascinated by Hungary. You've had some more fringy group, uh, folks openly supportive of Putin, or people, some figure like Trump is actually kind of like, you know, Putin curious, like, you know, friendly toward Putin, right? Um, you have like the phenomenon of CPAC Brazil, you know, in the Bolsonaro era. So it is, it is an odd dynamic that the more nationalist the right has become in the United States, the more international it also is in, in trying to draw out these connections between the Hungarian right or the Brazilian right or the Israeli right or the, um, at the Indian right. You know, the, the, uh, the relationship between Trump and Modi was always of great interest to me because they were very similar figures uh, in a lot of ways, and they got along. Um, so yes, I think there's something to that. I, I lament the fact that the right is moving in this direction. I, 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 you know, I think that the conservative movement stood for a set of ideas that were was rooted in philosophy. It was more than just, as you said, nationalism, populism, traditionalism. It had a, it had a framework that you know touched on all those aspects in some ways, but also had a, a set of principles that could lead it to formulate plans, you know, and actually maybe even achieve something once it was in power. Yeah, it, see less of that now. Yes, and it, it's. Interesting to try and think of what unites all of those regimes that you pointed out. And I, I, anti elitism seems to be maybe the biggest uniter in that. And, and that is their definition of what an elite is, because they're, of course, elites within their system, but their definition of what an elite is within their country and a distaste for that, which is a, which is a, running theme in American history from the before the founding and of course in other countries histories that maybe that's all the right is in some sense not all but like that doesn't mean free markets it could if the elites are against free markets then maybe they'd be for free markets and it doesn't necessarily mean isolationism unless the elite is for uh, some sort of you know non-isolationist foreign policy it's just sort of standing against which seems quite rudderless if you don't give it more and maybe that's what you're saying you're afraid of, that the Trumpism is not more, like there were rudders to the conservative movement and now, and the right in general, and now there's there, there are fewer rudders to guide them with principles. 
Well, think about the Trump presidency for a second. Um, he is, of course, wins office on the basis of this national populist traditionalist right, while also benefiting from, I think, the electorate's distaste for Hillary Clinton, right? So he comes into power and there's all this talk That is a about, very specific you know, is, form of anti-elitism too, just being anti-Hillary. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, it's peculiar to one person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but uh, it, it helped him become president uh, by winning the electoral college. And yet, what were his most significant achievements? They were all based on longstanding goals of the conservative movement. The tax reform, the judges, the deregulation, spending more on defense. These are things that are standbys. You know, he had to kind of see them through, I think, because he was oh, um, afraid of losing what little support he had. You know, he, his coalition was so kind of, it was almost like a, you know, like a neutron star, so compact. If you lose one part of it, then you're totally done. But by the time that he had achieved those things, you know, uh, what was left? He didn't start building that border wall until the final year of his presidency. Um, that it, what's left was the anti-elitism, the fights with Dr. Fauci, you know, the going back and forth over the pandemic, you know, liberate Michigan one day, we need to be cautious the next day. Um, I think I think you do need a set of ideas to shape and channel the populist rejection of expertise and elite opinion. And um, otherwise, uh, the populists will just become more frustrated. Because I, I am sympathetic to the idea that experts and elites get it wrong a lot, or they're not seeing what needs to be addressed. But if you don't have answers to those questions of what to do about the problems, you're just going to get angrier. And I think we've seen that when um, the Republicans controlled just the House of Representatives during the Obama years. And I think we saw some of that in the Trump years as well. Of course, I have to ask, in your opinion, and maybe you'll just turn it around to me, but are libertarians on the right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah this is the big uh, conceptual dilemma. Um, I would say that uh, in the American context, they are uh, in their criticisms of uh, kind of the New Deal structure of government. Um the economic coercion that's involved, the um, centralization of power, the magnification of the executive. Um, and I think that they're on the, in, they were on the right in the sense that they were, um, there had in many cases shared goals um, as the conservative movement. But there are of course huge areas where the, these two movements diverge. And the most important that I kind of get into in the book is on the issue of foreign policy. Whereas um, uh, the, you know, that I talk about that 1969 Young Americans for Freedom Convention, which basically collapsed into a riot uh, between the conservatives and the libertarians <laughs> over the issue of Vietnam, uh, foreign intervention. And of course, we see that played out as well during the uh, W. Bush era, where the Ron Paul liberty movement comes into being to criticize uh, the war on terrorism and the invasion of Iraq. So I think it's on um, foreign policy where the conservatives and the libertarians are the most distinct. Now, you, t you touch on this in many different eras, and, and you're, I think, quite open about racism and, and nationalism because. Uh, of course, there are racists on on all sides of the political spectrum, but it does seem to be the case that if sort of nationalism and traditionalism are and anti elitism are a cornerstone of what the right is, then it's more susceptible 
to ra racism because nationalism and racism are very easy to get intertwined with each other, uh, at least on that level, um, than the left. Uh, and you've seen that, I think, in different things that identified themselves as of the right that definitely had racist components to them. Or, or, or am I mischaracterizing? You don't say that explicitly, but I kind of see it in there. Oh, look, I, I mean, I think uh, you can't tell the story of America without talking about race. And so this book in a lot of ways is a work of American history because I'm telling kind of the story of American politics from this angle over a hundred years. And so had to address the question of race. And I wanted to show the points where leaders on the right um, or leaders who the right elements of the right welcomed and championed engage in racist behavior. And for me, the most painful example is that in the 1950s, um, William F. Buckley Jr. wrote the editorials opposing the 1957 and 1959 Civil Rights Acts, passed under Eisenhower. And he did so in ways that were not... Uh, talking about limited government, you know, and how in a constitutional structure, the federal government really can't interfere in the state police powers. He was using cultural arguments. And uh, that was, you know, that's something I felt I had to recognize in the book, uh, and that sometimes conservatives try to minimize or shy away from. But it is true. Um, you know, many times, many of these leaders I talk about, they recant their views later. And, but the fact that they were on the wrong side of the Civil Rights Act, of the Voting Rights Act, of certainly of the Civil Rights Act of the Eisenhower era, I think has always put a ceiling on the appeal of American conservatism. Um, and I, I think that was, that was an important point to make in the book as well. The interesting thing that was unclear to me getting into the last chapter and the conclusion is that it, you tell the story and part of it is, as I said, it could have been a kind of full circle to some extent. I was, when I saw the book, I'm like, okay, it'd be interesting to see, you know, how populism and ideas have kind of gone back and forth in the history of the American right. And, you know, if you get, grew up in the Reagan era, it's not always going to be that way. Populists will come back and ideas will change and there's sort of a back and forth based on reaction to the left. That being said, that would just put Trump in context and just say, another example of another populist conservative coming up like we've had many in the past. Or is it different? Is this different than before? Uh, the, is what Trump has done, is what the ideas that he's talking about, is the level of anger, is something different about this for the history of the American right than other times in the past that such things have come up? Well, I think it's different in that Trump was president. Trump's influence as president really began to show itself when you started having kind of the Matt Gateses and the Lauren Boberts and the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world kind of come out and they're kind of mini Trumps, they're kind of the MAGA squad, which is the antithesis of the socialist squad that, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez leads. Um, you had Trump was always embraced conspiracy theories. That's how he really entered politics during the Obama years, by embracing the birther conspiracy theory. So the guardrails that tried to kind of push back against the growing fringes collapsed under Trump. I think social media plays a role in this as well, but I, ultimately I think it's leadership that counts a lot too. And leadership's, leadership validates certain ideas and certain tactics. And of course, with Trump's response to the election in 2020, a whole new set of norms was broken, right? That's what makes it different. Now, what I don't know the answer to is eventually Trump won't 
be alive. Okay. <laughs> you know, eventually we all die. Uh, he's got great genes. We know that. He tells that Dr. Ronnie told him that, you know. Uh, but no one is immortal. He hasn't figured that out yet. And the question to me is when he is no longer able to exercise the role in the Republican Party that he has exercised since 2015 and that he wants to continue to exercise, I believe, what does that party look like? It's obviously going to carry with it the legacy of the Trump years, the Trump era. And that means that it's going to be more populist. It's going to be more nationalist. It's going to be more traditionalist. But will there be an opportunity for a new set of leaders to emerge? Will there be the opportunity for people who believe in um, a fusionism of libertarianism and traditionalism, the more classic conservative philosophy in the, of the 20th century? Will we be able to kind of reassert ourselves? Will there be a willingness among Republican elected officials to think seriously about policy and governance? Or will it just be reflexive collapse into culture war, uh, into anti-elitism, and into kind of a disengagement from the world that means, you know, we close up the borders, we close up trade. We try to reduce all of our commitments overseas. I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that the le one of the lessons in my books, it, it, my book is, is that it is an open question because these, these tendencies have always been in circulation. They've always been jostling for supremacy. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.